So over the past couple of years as a structural engineer, I've had to design lots of steel beams. And throughout this time, I've read a bunch of textbooks, watched a lot of videos on the topic, and even tediously trawled my way through software calculation reports, all in the pursuit of learning exactly how it's done. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing what I've learned and explaining everything you need to know to design a steel floor beam. I'm gonna be starting with the very basics and giving you a refresher on the standard design process for any beam. Then I'll introduce you to the full example problem I'm going to be solving in this video. After this, I'll be diving into the hand calculations and show you how to calculate the loads and set up your load combinations. Then I'll walk you through the required deflection and strength checks to actually size your beam. And finally, at the end of the video, I'm going to show you how you can do the exact same design using a popular design software called Space Gas. So whether you're new to steel beam design or you've struggled with it in the past, stick with me and I'll show you exactly how it's done. Alright, so first up, let's quickly go through the standard design process for any beam. Simply put, there are five general steps. Step one is the layout, and here the main goal is to find a configuration that works within the architect limits. So this means that you need to do things like finding an appropriate place to support the beam, working out whether the beam's going to be simply supported, continuous or a cantilever, and also working out crucial dimensions like the length. Step 2 is loads. In this step you're working out all the different loads that will act on the beam. For example this could be dead load, live load, wind loads, earthquake loads or even snow loads. Step 3 is load combinations. Here it's all about adding individual load cases together and coming up with a bunch of serviceability and strength load combinations. The way in which you add your individual load cases together and apply load factors does change depending on the area you're designing for, but it's all outlined in the relevant code or standard. Step four is deflection checks. In this step, we're basically just ensuring that under certain load cases, the beam doesn't move too much or even just have too big of a noticeable sag. And step five is strength checks. Here we're essentially just ensuring that the beam is strong enough to resist the applied loads and has an adequate factor of safety. For a beam, this is checking things like the bending capacity and the shear capacity. Also, because the first layout you choose doesn't always end up working structurally or you just change your mind, you often end up having to repeat these steps a couple of times. All right, now that we're on the same page with the general design procedure, let's go through the layout for the steel beam that we're gonna be designing. So for this example, we're gonna be designing a steel floor beam within a two-story timber framed house. The beam will support floor joists that connect into the side of it and the joists will also be supported at two outer walls as well as at two internal walls. Above the beam there will be a load bearing wall that supports timber roof trusses and these trusses will be covered with steel roof sheeting. The dead live and wind load allowances we will be taking for each respective element are these values here and the dimensions as well as a plan view of this beam is as shown. The beam will be simply supported between two steel columns and is five meters long. From here, everything is basically set up, so let's move on to the hand calculation design process. Alright, so the first thing that we need to do is work out the loads that this beam is going to take. For this example, that will be self-weight, dead load, live load, and wind load. Now for self-weight, because we haven't actually designed the beam yet, we will need to take some allowance based off an educated guess. For this particular design, I'm going to assume that we need nothing bigger than a 200 UB, so I'm going to take 0.3 kilonewtons per meter. Later on, we will need to check this and make sure that this guess wasn't too light. Also, the book you saw me get the section properties from and later on I'll be getting design capacities from is made for Australian standards, but depending on where you're designing for, you can get similar local resources. One example of this which you can download for free is called the Blue Book and it's made for Euro codes. Anyways, for the rest of the loads, in order to work out how much load the beam will take, we need to find the beam's tributary load width for both the floor and the roof. To find a member's tributary width, you basically basically just half the distance between load bearing elements and the resulting width goes to that member. So for the roof that would be 6 meters and for the floor that would be 3 meters. Now to work out the load from each load type, you need to multiply the matching area load by the load width. For example, for dead load that would be 0.4 kPa times 6 meters for the roof, plus 0.5 kPa times 3 meters for the floor, plus 0.3 kPa times 2.4 meters for the load bearing wall. You then just need to repeat this process for the other load types. Once you've calculated out all your individual load cases, it's time to combine them and work out your serviceability and ultimate limit state combination loads. The exact way that you combine your individual load cases and what factors you use does depend on which code you're designing for, but again, I'm gonna be using Australian standards, so my load factors and combinations are as shown. At this point, all the loads have now 
now been calculated, so it's time to move on to the first of the design checks, which is deflection. Now, for a simply supported beam, the maximum deflection is given by this formula. Where this formula comes from is something that you should have covered by your second year of university, so I'm not going to go into it, but if you want a convenient website where you can go and find these formulas, the one I like to use is called StructX. Anyways, for this check, under the serviceability load case, self-weight plus 0.6 times live load, the deflection is less than the minimum of 12 millimeters or span on 250. And to do this, the first thing we need to do is find whether 12 millimeters or span on 250 is our limit. And we can do this by subbing in our beam length, which is 5,000 millimeters. And from a quick calculation, we can see that 12 millimeters is our limit. From here, we need to rearrange the deflection formula and solve for the second moment of area I. After this calculation, we now need to go back to our beam property tables and pick a beam with a larger second moment of area than the one we just found. For this example, that is the 200 UB 29.8. Now, since this beam also takes wind loading, the Australian standards say that we also need to check this load case too, but since the deflection criteria is the same and the load for the previous load case was bigger, a 200UB 29.8 will also be okay for this check too. Now, before we move on, there is one more check that I like to do for floor beams, and that is vibration. In this check, essentially all we're doing is making sure that the beam isn't too bouncy. And in the Australian standards, it says if you can keep the deflection less than two millimeters with a one kilonewton point load at the center of the beam, then it'll be okay. So for this check, I use the max deflection formula for a point load on a simply supported beam and just sub in my numbers. As this beam now satisfies all the deflection criteria, Criteria, we can now move on to the strength checks. For the strength checks, we need to ensure that both the bending capacity and the shear capacity is adequate. For the bending capacity, because we have floor joists at 450 centers framing into the side of the beam that are capable of providing lateral restraint, we can check the design bending moment against the section capacity of the beam. As a bit of a side note, understanding what a lateral restraint does and where you should put them on different beam arrangements is pretty crucial, so if you don't quite understand understand it, it's definitely worth reading up on. In short, when a beam is loaded and bends, the compression flange wants to buckle out to the side. By providing a restraint on the compression flange to stop the beam from buckling out, you increase the member bending capacity. Purlins and fly braces are probably two of the most common examples of members that provide lateral restraints to beams. Anyways, because the floor joists provide a lateral restraint to both the top and bottom of our floor joists, we can design for the largest load and know that our beam will be okay for both the uplift and downward case. For our load combinations, the largest load is from our 1.2 times dead load plus 1.5 times live load combination. Again, because our beam is simply supported and the load is a UDL, the design bending moment can be found by using WL squared on eight, and the design shear force can be found by using WL on two. Now, going back to the section capacity book from earlier, you can read both the bending moment section capacity and also the shear capacity. Just so you know, all the values in this table have been calculated from first principles, and the formulas to manually calculate these values are these ones here, but realistically, once you've done this calculation once, the standard procedure is just reading from these tables. Also, I want to point out the bending moment utilization factor of 1.95 because this is one of the values I'm going to compare against the software. Now, that brings me to the end of the hand calculation process, and as you saw, the 200 UB I assumed at the start did work for everything, so my assumption for self weight was okay, and this is the end of the calculation. But as promised, I am going to quickly model this beam in space gas and verify my results. Alright, so first up I model the beam, input the supports, and select my geometry and material. Next I input my load cases, and set up my load combinations. After this I put in my steel member design parameters, so that the program will automatically check my design, and then I'm ready to run the solver. Clearly this factor is much greater than 1, so the beam is okay, but this particular beam is deflection governed, so that's why the beam is overkill for the strength design side of things. For deflection, again we can see that with our 200UB 29.8, we get a deflection of less than 12mm, and for the 1kN point load case, a deflection of less than 2mm. All in all, it's pretty 
pretty clear that both methods would give the same results, but using a program like SpaceGas would allow you to do things a lot quicker and easily make any changes if you had to. Also, for anyone interested in giving SpaceGas a go, they do offer a free trial as well as a free student version. Anyways, I hope that you learned something from this video, and if you did enjoy it, you might like this video here where I take you through five of the structural engineering projects that taught me how to design. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.